Well, folks, in a surprise drop this week, Daily Wire is releasing a brand new film. It is called Lady Ballers. If you haven't seen the trailer, well, we're going to show that to you in just a second. I'm joined here by the director, writer, star, key grip of, hey, of, the, of the film. Jeremy I have no key grip. <laughs> <laughs> I have no, you have to have actual skills to be a key grip. So I want to show the trailer. We're going to watch the trailer. Then we're going to react to the trailer. And then we're going to talk about how this movie came to be because it's absurd on every possible <laughs> level. So let's play this thing. In a world where women's sports is being transformed, the Daily Wire calls foul with the most triggering comedy of the year. Guys, this is serious. Sports can be your pathway to a better life. Well, like yours? <laughs> Please don't steal my catalytic converter again. Winning matters. It's the key ingredient in becoming a winner. Yeah, maybe you should try it sometime. Are you gonna move? I am not. <laughs> Let's cut to the chase. I know you're not a woman. Hey, you don't know how he identifies. If you can beat them. What do you know about the US Opens for the Global Games? You want us to compete as women. $5,000 prizes. My lover says you were a great coach back in the day. Join them. This is the way the world is now. My eight-year-old daughter told me all about it. So a guy can become a girl with no physical changes at all. Oh, that's called gender fluid. So I can be a woman on the court and a man in the bedroom. I can't believe it. Nice. You mean when you're sleeping? Yes. Coach. Alex. We, we could play, play basketball. basketball. We have to get the whole team back together. It's time. We're in. I'm in. I'm in to play Lady Baldur's. Mount up. Like a girl. That's right. I'm with her. Oh. Oh. Believe in my truth. Uh. This is my truth. From heroes. Day one of being a girl athlete. <laughs> I love being a girl. To sheroes. We could dominate every woman's sport. Running. Swimming, soccer. I said sport, Felix. It's ladies basketball, boys. Nobody watches. Excuse me. Are these seats open? <laughs> ne never mind. Getting dunks. <laughs> and tucking trunks. Oh, no, she didn't. That's the biggest I've ever seen on a lady. I don't care. Lady Ballers. One can even be trans age now, which provides Sheelix with a wonderful opportunity to relive all the experiences that she missed out on in school. <laughs> Streaming exclusively on Daily Wire Plus, December 1st. <laughs> So that's the thing you did. Yeah, yeah. yeah we like to make friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go back to the inception of this idea. So you approached me and you said we should make a fictional film about this topic. Now, to be fair, I think I'd actually suggested to the Crane Boys that they do this as a doc. Yes. I, I originally went to them and I said, you guys should like go try out for a bunch of ladies' leagues. And that became not possible because, as it turns out, most ladies' leagues don't allow in actual Brutes. men, actual men and uh, they weren't willing to go the full distance <laughs> in terms of what it would require in order to, you know, the actual hormone treatments and everything to play in some of the ladies' leagues. But in any case, it turned into this. So explain. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that you have to understand is that uh, I was getting ready to leave the country to go make our Pendragon series on July 9th. And somewhere about mid-March, I thought, wouldn't it be great if between today and July 9th, we wrote and produced an entire feature film. And so, yeah, the, the Crane Boys mentioned the idea that you had given them, and, and it had been in the back of my mind that, you know, we really should be making the movies that only we can make. In fact, I think it's a line that you had, had come up with. You know, what are the things that only we can do? And so I, I thought, well, obviously, there has not been a true comedy made since Barack Obama became president. I mean, Barack Obama destroyed three things. Rock and roll, Comedy and America. <laughs> that was the, other than that, he was a perfectly average president, you know. But 
it, it became impossible to tell a joke during the Obama administration because Obama made this sort of pact with, uh, with culture shapers that, that they should change their fundamental understanding of themselves. And in the case of comedians, they should no longer you know, mock the absurd, but they should be agents for social change. The head writer of SNL famously said uh, you know, that they would make no jokes about Barack Obama. He said, there's literally nothing funny about this man. It is as though he is carved from a, a single piece of pure obsidian which in itself is one of the funniest things that anyone has ever said, because if anything, it was you know half of a slab of pure obsidian and the other was snow white marble. Also a little racist, but yes. A, l- a little yeah. racist. Uh, but this is the view that they took of Obama because of his sort of singular religious affect. You couldn't make any jokes anywhere ever. And you've seen, I mean, comedy has changed fundamentally in that era and Hollywood stopped making these kinds of films. You go back to the early 2000s, you have some of the great comedies, you know, probably ends, culminates with Tropic Thunder, it starts with Dodgeball, ends with Tropic Thunder. I, I miss those movies. You miss those movies. I think our audience misses those movies. And there's never been anything funnier or more mockable or more laughably absurd in the mainstream part of our culture than letting grown-ass dudes beat up women <laughs> by calling themselves chicks. I mean, it's, it's patently absurd. Uh, and so, yeah, it was like, well, there's, there's a joke that needs to be told that only we can tell. Uh, so let's try to do it somehow in the next 90 days. We'll get to more with Jeremy in just one second. First, Pure Talk has you covered for the holidays with a free Moto G 5G phone. No gimmicks, no trade-in necessary. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and 15 gigs of data. You get all of that for just 35 bucks. You'll get the Moto G 5G phone for free. But here's the deal. You need to move fast because these phones are almost gone. So if your current phone is on life support, upgrade for free with Pure Talk. The new Moto G 5G boasts a two-day battery life, an exceptional quad-pixel camera, and a whole lot more. Pure Talk will give you America's most dependable 5G network at half the price. So go ahead and make that switch today. Go to puretalk.com slash Shapiro, get this exclusive offer, select the plan that's right for your family. Remember, Pure Talk gives you America's most dependable 5G network at half the price. So make that switch today. That's puretalk.com slash Shapiro. Claim your free Moto G 5G phone with a qualifying plan. Again, that's puretalk.com. Slash Shapiro. Pure Talk is simply smarter wireless. I've been using them for my own coverage for years at this point. Go check them out. PureTalk.com slash Shapiro. Tis the season of giving. And what better way to express love and appreciation than by presenting the timeless and exquisite gift of fine pearl jewelry. At the Pearl Source, you get the highest quality pearl jewelry at up to 70% off retail prices. The Pearl Source cuts out the middleman by eliminating those crazy markups by jewelry stores and selling directly to you, the consumer. You can order from the comfort of your own home. You'll find the largest selection of pearls available anywhere. Each jewelry piece is custom made specifically for you. The Pearl Source let me choose from a custom set of pearls for my wife. And let me just tell you, she loves the pearls. She wears them like all the time. It's some of the best jewelry she has in her collection. They make stellar stuff. It's time to start shopping for the holiday season. Don't wait until it's too late. The Pearl Source offers fast and free two-day shipping on every order. And if you're not sure if she's going to love the gift, the Pearl Source comes then no hassle, 60-day money-back guarantee with free return shipping. So again, it's risk-free. Give a gift that can be passed down for generations. For a limited time, listeners to my show can take 20% off your entire order. Do not wait until it's too late to do that holiday shopping. Go to thepearlsource.com. Enter promo code Ben at checkout for 20% off your entire order. If you want fine pearl jewelry at the best prices online, go straight to the source with the Pearl Source. That's thepearlsource.com. Enter promo code Ben at checkout. That's thepearlsource.com. Promo code Ben. That's the craziest part of this is that (laughs) basically there was a script. You ended up going through and rewriting a lot of the script. You ended up... You know, so, directing the film, you ended up being the star of the film. And that, that was basically demanded by circumstance by because circumstance. So, th- there are more actors who are willing to be yep. in the film because of all of what you're I was getting about. ready to go to Europe on a location scout. And I sat down uh, two writers th- that have worked with us in the past, Brian Hoffman and Nick Sheehan, both really talented guys. And I said, guys, I'm leaving for two weeks. When I come back, I need a script. Here's what it has to be about. And I outlined for them what I wanted the, the movie to be. I went and scouted Romania and Bulgaria and Serbia uh, looking for places to shoot Pendragon, came back, and they had had done yeoman's work. They put together a, a script in that in that time. They solved some plot elements that were really good. Um, but sort of like everyone that we approached with this idea originally, no one wants to go all the way. And so I did a little work on the script to help make sure that it went went the full distance, and then we started going out to actors. And literally every single actor that we went out to for every single role told us no. And I want to be clear that this isn't like they read the script and said, this isn't funny. Many of them told us no, just point blank on the phone when we pitched the idea. And I also want to be clear that these aren't actors like, I mean, we didn't go out to Leo DiCaprio. You know, we're going out to people who 
are on our side, who have been telling us for years, since we first got into movies, we'll, do, we'll walk across broken glass to be in a Daily Wire movie. This is people who have, in many cases, already been canceled. And even they would say to us upon hearing this pitch, guys, that's the one thing. Like, <laughs> no way. That, you, you'll never, it's not just that you won't work again. Like, you will be uh, a persona non grata in every room you ever walk right, into. They will the fire you from a cannon into the sun, yes. They, uh, that's correct. Uh, and it was really shocking. I, I suppose it shouldn't have been, but to hear these already canceled conservative actors who've, who've wanted to do things with us, just unwilling to touch the material. And, and that's when sort of the idea of, well, what if it was just us? What if The Daily Wire truly made the movie that only The Daily Wire could make? Uh, and I, we all had some trepidation about that going in. I want to say, though, that I, I can't imagine any better way that it could have gone because if we had gotten any of those actors, yes, they would have had skills that we don't have. They wouldn't have taken the jokes as far as we took them. They wouldn't have been willing to go the distance. And our guys, particularly Crane and co, you know, Jake Crane, Blaine Crane, and David Cohn, they committed themselves so completely to this process. And I, I was telling you in, in the makeup chair before we started, like the things, the physical stuff they subjected themselves to, you know, both from like body transformation, losing weight, gaining muscle, all of that piece of it, but then just also all the stunts, the hard days we were working. We had an 18-hour day our last day. And these guys, you know, they were, they were elite athletes before they moved into the uh, sports commentary space. And you see, you see it when you work with them, just absolute dedication and completely hilarious. And of course, pretty much everybody cameos in this thing. Some have smaller cameos oh, yeah. than others. Uh, My I cameo will, is not very large, but... Your it, cameo is not very large, but I will say it is the bluest comedy in the entire film. That's true. It is, it is exactly <laughs> what... Anyone who knows that you're funny, which is apparently no one on the left who never <laughs> understand when you're making a joke, but anyone who actually watches your show will be like, there goes Ben. <laughs> there goes Ben Benin. <laughs> and it is hilarious. And uh, obviously we have everybody from Riley Gaines to Ted Cruz makes an appearance yeah. in, in that. Well, you know, I... I watched Wedding Crashers and it's, it's, it's and John his acting McCain. debut, right? I mean, like That's Ted right. has been Ted has been itching for this all his life since he was doing high school yeah, drama, right. and then somehow ended up in the United States Senate and also running for president. Yeah. What he actually wanted, of course, this is, if he had gotten this when he was twenty, he never would have been in politics. So I will tell you that that's one hundred percent true, and it is the perfect movie for Ted because what people may not know, uh, the man loves basketball. I mean, it's true. He played he played Jimmy Kimmel. He played right? Jimmy Kimmel and beat him. Uh, he, he loves basketball. He wants to be an actor. In fact, I, I've never told anybody this. In fact, he'll, he'll be mad at me for telling this. But, uh, you know, he, he's in a tough re-election race right now back in Texas. And obviously, we need Ted Cruz in the Senate. Um, but I called him and said, hey, I know that there's no way you can do this, but you should come to Hungary and be in Pendragon. I said, I've got a role. I will physically transform you. It won't be a cameo. No one will know it's you. We won't market that you are in it. It'll just, you can actually come transform yourself and spend a week with us, and actually act. And I thought, you know, I'm giving a pal his actual dream. And then he reminded me that he has an actual job <laughs> with enormous responsibilities. But for this, uh, he was willing to come out and do a cameo for us and, and was truly funny. And, uh, and then we played a little one-on-one. -on -one and I do not have a dream of playing basketball. <laughs> and so, yes, I was also skunked by... Uh, by a sitting senator. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's definitely all of your Daily Wire favorites. Yes. Ma Matt Walsh is in it. He's hysterical. You saw him there. I, I know you may have missed him because he doesn't look like Matt Walsh, <laughs> but in fact, that is Matt Walsh. With a man bun. Yeah. Uh, you, got, you got Michael Moles and uh, Brett Cooper in it as well. Michael gives the most offensive performance in the film. Shocker. Yeah. I can't believe it. The most shocking. Uh, Finally justifying that, that salary. Yeah. And there are cameos that we haven't, Announced yet? Some other people who who show up and uh, and get some laughs for us, which you know, as the as the days draw toward the actual premiere, we'll we'll release some of that info. But so I want to go through some of the tweets that uh, that people have been sending. Mm. So, mo most positive, uh, I would say the reception on Twitter particularly has been astonishingly good, overwhelmingly. I mean, it's been probably twenty million views at this point on Twitter, well, somewhere in that neighborhood. Also, we talk about this as though it's a controversial issue because the left pretends that it's a controversial issue. Virtually every human being alive today and every human being alive until today has known that men should not compete against women in women's sports. I mean, that, that Blaine clip where he's picking up 
the girl and throwing her to the mat. <laughs> I mean, like, first of all, <laughs> it's hilarious. But but also, like, it's hilarious because that's absurd and that should never be allowed under any circumstances. And that is actually happening in the actual world. No, I can say watching that be shot was difficult. I mean, we had a great professional stunt woman, a true pro. She's wearing, you know, a, a skeletal body armor, basically, that's made to do this sort of thing. And it still hurt. I mean, Blaine is lifting her off the ground and slamming her into the, into the mat. You have to do it over and over. I felt so bad for her. She was such a trooper. And I got in the van on the way home that night thinking, man, we're genuinely being terrible to women in the making of, of this movie. And then I realized, oh no, this is real. You can fight MMA. You know, the first biological man to fight against a woman in the MMA broke her skull. And the left is celebrating this. Meanwhile, everyone knows it's wrong. And only this weird virtue signaling, social proof culture uh, causes us, well, not us, but causes many people to pretend that they don't know that it's wrong. And so what I think is great about our movie is it does what comedy is supposed to do. It actually points out an absurdity. The movie is the movie is absurd, but it's only as absurd as the real world. We're just choosing to frame it in a way that allows you to laugh at it. I think this movie is is less akin to dodgeball. Tonally, it's like dodgeball, but uh, thematically, it's much less dodgeball, and it's it's much more. Um, uh, what was your movie um, that you turned me on to? Uh, about Stalin. Oh, Death of Stalin. Death of Stalin. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's much more Death of Stalin. Because underneath there's like an actual serious It's like, no, this is on. actually what happened. Right. It's just okay to laugh. Right, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so yeah. let's look at some of the tweets. So Riley Gaines, who, uh, who is cameoing, and then she says, highlighting the absurdity of allowing men into women's sports through comedy and what's supposed to be satire. This is the way. So excited for this. Make sure to watch Lady Ballers featuring me and some of the most influential people in the conservative movement on 12.1. Yeah, Ry- Riley's in it. She's great. You couldn't make a movie about this topic and not have Riley in the film. Seth Dillon from the Babylon Bee says, yes, the madness must be mocked. Well done, Jeremy. You'll get a mention when I win Best Supporting Actor for my part in this. Yeah. So I, I, I guess I wasn't there the day that, that Seth was on. So, set. you know, I, I was trying to decide who do we ask to cameo in the film, and uh, I needed someone who was the kind of beta, low-grade guy who would allow himself to be tied to furnaces, uh, <laughs> the kind of grifter who would actually put forth men to participate in women's sports. And the first guy I thought of, of course, was Seth Dillon. <laughs> uh, Seth has been so good. And th- this is actually, when I, when I called Seth and asked him to be in the film, uh, I, I said in all sincerity, there are very few people who have been more consistently outspoken on the issue than Seth. Uh, and, you know... Which Seth, is the reason Elon Musk currently owns X. That's yes. exactly right. You know, Seth, Seth in, in some ways some very direct ways contributed. By making jokes about this topic, he changed the world. That's right. Contributed to the preservation of free speech in our time. And so, yeah, to have having Seth in the movie was, uh, was, was an honor. And he's funny. And Wokeness tweeted, this is what we've all been craving for so long. Actual comedy. Lady Ballers is going to be one of the top blockbusters of the year. Mark my words. Uh, by the way, I, I think that's actually true. I don't know if you saw how Wish did over the weekend, but I think there's a significant yeah. possibility this outperforms Wish. I mean, that's not that's a very low bar. Top blockbuster. It's a low bar in 2023. And uh, and then uh, somebody uh, people people were tweet. Of course, the best tweet of all time. This so, is this is truly one of your best tweets. Thank you. I appreciate it. So people were trending Juana Man yesterday because so it of turns course, out that there was a movie 20 years ago called Juana Man, right? Which I learned about yesterday. Yeah, and um and I knew that it was there, but it had not occurred to me that uh, people would see the similarity because. I mean, frankly, it's transphobic to see the similarity. So mm-hmm. Juana Man is the tragic tale of a basketball player in the UBA, not the W, not the NBA, the UBA. And uh, he ends up being expelled from the UBA. And it's basically Tootsie, but basketball and bad. Uh, and, uh, and he ends up going to the WUBA and playing in the WUBA and falling in love with his roommate. But of course, he's supposed to be a girl. And this creates all sorts of, it's exactly, it's the plot of Tootsie, but with lowbrow and basketball. But to compare that to this is just sick. I'm sorry. It is tra- As I say, how dare you compare Lady Ballers, a movie about beautiful trans women, with Juana Man, a movie about a man pretending to be a woman. Your bigotry is horrifying. And it's so true. It's so true. By the way, this is, it, it is kind of amazing, though. So all these people on the left were blithely comparing our film That's right. to Juana Man, which shows that they know the thing, right? Because Juana Man is about a man. Literally, He doesn't pretend that he's actually a woman, he pretend, he's a man pretending to be a woman. He doesn't say, 
I am a woman, therefore I get to play in the WUBA. He's a man pretending to yeah. be a woman it's Mrs. for Delphi. advantage. He's, he's, yeah, it's wrong and he's hiding it. Right. He's afraid to get caught. So when you guys compare our movie to Juana Man, what are you saying about trans mm -hmm. women in sports? What are you actually saying about trans women in sports? Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> also, yes, if you look back 20 years to a time before Barack Obama was president, there were comedies. Sure. <laughs> right. I mean, hot chicks with, I mean, that, that, I mean yeah. Blaine picking up that girl and slamming, and that's, that's Rob Schneider taking a pillow and just bashing a girl into a wall. That's right. And you used to be able to do that because the idea of it is hilarious and stupid and wrong. And this is going to be a criticism that we get from people on the right who are uh, jealous that we made a movie and didn't include them. They're going to say, you know, the Daily Wire made a drag comedy, blah, blah, blah. Yes, because for all of human history, dudes dressing like chicks is funny. Because it's incongruous and <laughs> silly. Thank you. That's right. And now we're supposed to pretend that that isn't funny. It's not only not funny, it's brave. Yeah. The bravest men are the ones who dress as women. The best men. Are, it, it, you always only say the that the best women are men, but also the best men are women. That's right. The best of them. Well, we, we are making the joke. You should go check out Lady Ballers. Again, it's going to be available only at dailywireplus.com. You can go check out Daily Wire, become a subscriber. And remember, when you do that, Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern time, I already have seen the film because, of course, I'm the star. Jeremy is merely a bit player. But when you, when you actually go see the film, you're going to love it. Friday, 8 p.m., you have to be a subscriber to see it. So go do that right now. Jeremy, it's great to see you and get, get your ass back to Europe. Yeah, I'm on my way. Finally, some good news. Because of you, my friends over at Preborn have rescued over 44,000 babies this year alone. Right now, thousands of moms are awaiting the birth of their precious babies. Thousands upon thousands of babies are currently taking their first breath since the beginning. Preborn's network of clinics has rescued over 280,000 babies. That is a miracle. For just 28 bucks, you can empower mom to choose life. Once she sees the precious life growing inside her and hears her baby's heartbeat, she's twice as likely to choose life. Ultrasound quality these days, absolutely astonishing. We have four kids. We met all of them in the womb long before they were born. When you do that for a mom, the chances that she's going to preserve the life of her child dramatically increase. Right now, through a match, your gift is doubled. Please give a generous gift that'll go 100% toward life. Have your donation doubled today by dialing pound 250 saying keyword baby. That's pound 250 baby or donate securely at preborn.com slash Ben. Again, that's preborn.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now by dialing pound 250 say keyword baby to get started and help save a life today or donate securely at preborn.com slash Ben. Well, now on to the serious news of the day. So on Monday, the richest man on earth, Elon Musk, visited Israel. There, he met with the families of hostages being held by Hamas. He toured the sites of the October 7th massacre, and he met with both Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Isaac Herzog. Musk sat through a video compiled from body cam footage of Hamas terrorists that day. He said it was horrifying to watch the joy of those terrorists as they committed their savage atrocities. This is video of that visit. He's in Kfar Aza. There he is with Prime Minister Netanyahu. By the way, when they are wearing the flak vest, that is not just for show. There is still live gunfire happening, not all that far away. Despite the quote-unquote ceasefire, there are still military operations that Hamas is attempting in the northern Gaza Strip right now. This is video, obviously, of Musk and Netanyahu looking at one of the cribs where babies were slaughtered. After this tour of Kfar Aza, Musk then held a press conference at which he spoke the plain truth about the situation on the ground. He was Here was Elon Musk summing it up. I would say an emotionally difficult day uh, to see the places where people were murdered. I just did a talk with the, the Prime Minister, and um, I think there's, I mean, obviously there, there, there are three things that need to happen uh, in, in the Gaza situation. I mean, there's no choice but to kill those who insist on uh, murdering civilians. There's no exactly. choice. Um, they're not going to change their mind. But, and then the second thing is to change the, the education so that a, a new generation of, of murderers is not trained to be murderers. And then, the, and then the third thing, which is also very important, is to try to build prosperity. Okay, this, what he's saying right there, that's an excellent three-pronged plan for destroying Hamas and other radical terrorist groups. You kill the people who murder the civilians, that means Hamas and its allies, you overhaul the education system in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, which are run by parties who hate Jews and seek the destruction of Israel. And you bring economic prosperity. 
Only after those steps are fulfilled can there be talk of some sort of peaceful settlement of the conflict, because only at that point will there be partners willing to make peace. This also happens to be the only strategy that has ever worked. Counterinsurgency strategies directed at hostile populations can only be successful over time. If the most militant members, the terrorists, are killed, the population is re-educated away from hatred, and economic prosperity becomes possible. And make no mistake, the population of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank is indeed wildly hostile to Israel and deeply anti-Semitic. The population, not just Hamas. That is not a slur, that is simply a reality. Here is video from yesterday of the Gazan population harassing Red Cross vehicles carrying Israeli hostages. Now, Hamas could have cleared the streets, but what do you see here? What do you see here? You see young children following the following the, the Red Cross van, mocking people inside. These are the Gazan civilians cheering because they know that this has bought them time. Hamas mocking the hostages who were taken. There's a triumphant parade of Hamas family members and friends. Again, look how many children are in the crowd here. Look how many kids here are mocking outside these Red Cross vans. Civilian children who are inside the Red Cross vans being being returned to their families. I mean, this is sick. This is a sickness. This is a sick mentality that would lead anybody to do something remotely like this. Again, those are civilians, including children, mocking Israeli hostages, also including children. These are the wages of educating an entire population in pure hatred. Here, for example, is video of a kindergarten graduation ceremony in Gaza. It doesn't look quite like your kid's graduation ceremony from kindergarten. And here's some video from Memory TV. And what you see are kids who are at a graduation ceremony. They are, they are acting as though they are terrorists, performing, quote unquote, military operations. These kids are five, planting fake gas canister bombs underneath fake tanks flanking doorways, performing actions that include kidnapping and killing, quote-unquote, enemy soldiers. Is it a, a graduation ceremony for five-year-olds? For five-year-olds at a kindergarten graduation ceremony in Gaza. I mean, this is insane. There's a young kid saying, stab, kill the occupier with stones and knives. Look at the... I mean, have you ever been... I have four kids. Three of them have graduated... Well, two of them have graduated kindergarten. And I can tell you, this looks nothing like my kids' graduation ceremonies from kindergarten. By the way, we're just starting to hear the stories of what the hostages went through in Gaza. According to the aunt of one of those hostages, it was civilians beating the hostage, 12 years old, as he entered Gaza. T.E. Lawrence, that'd be Lawrence of Arabia, once compared making war on insurgents to, quote, eating soup with a knife. He said it was messy and slow. That, of course, is right. The model for such counterinsurgency tactics is the British counterinsurgency against communist revolutionaries in Malaya from 1948 to 1960. By the time that counterinsurgency had started, the British had already had forces in country for about a century. According to historian Andrew Roberts and General David Petraeus in their new book, Conflict, the Malayan campaign was a mixture of stick and carrot, quote, Providing people with electricity, drinking water, schools, clinics, and property rights proved a powerful disincentive for them to support Maoism. But a heady enticement of security had a dialectical partner. Firm discipline for those who disobeyed. This, by the way, included, in some cases, strictly rationing diets to like half daily calorie count. The British leadership also knew the strategy would take a very long time. The general in charge of the operation said he would, quote, shoot the bastard who says this emergency is over. Eventually, after more than a decade, the British did win. Israel can secure its future too, but only if it takes the time and effort necessary to do so. And this means ignoring the stupidity of those who want a quick ending to what will be a long struggle. The first step in that struggle, destroying Hamas, what Elon Musk said, is what Israel is going to have to do. That's what Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu makes clear. Here he was yesterday in a live chat with Musk. If you want peace, destroy Hamas. If you want security, destroy Hamas. If you want a better life for the Palestinians, in Gaza, who've been hijacked uh, by Hamas, destroy Hamas. Uh, all of that is a precursor to the question that you asked. You first have to get rid of the poisonous regime, uh, as you did in Germany, as you did in Japan yeah. uh, in World War II. These were two. There's no choice. There's no choice. Uh, so uh, that, that's this, a prerequisite. Yes. No but, but then look at what happened. I mean, what you had in Germany was denazification, and what you had in uh, Japan under. Uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur was a cultural uh, reformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and Japan that you visit today 
is so different from Japan of the 1930s. Yeah. Germany that you visit today is so different from Germany of the 1930s. Well, is that possible in the Arab world? And I categorically say, of course it is, because we've seen it already in two places. We've seen it in the Gulf states, and we see that when you visit Dubai or when you visit uh, Abu Dhabi uh, or when you visit Bahrain, you see something entirely different. Sure. And of course, Netanyahu is totally right. Hamas has to be destroyed. Why? Well, because they can't be reformed. They're an evil terrorist group. In fact, Hamas apparently just transferred control of the entire Bibi's family, which includes a four-year-old and a 10-month-old, to the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, another terrorist group, apparently for money. Hamas military leader Yahya Sinwar apparently appeared personally to the hostages in the tunnels to show them his power. One hostage was forced to write a ridiculous letter before her release, talking about how Hamas had, quote, treated her daughter like a queen while in captivity. I'm not kidding. Hamas is evil, full stop. This is why early calls for Israel to stop its operations against Hamas aren't just foolish, they're dangerous. When Bernie Sanders jabbers about Israel's cruelty towards civilians, he is not protecting civilians. He is making their lives more dangerous. Since if he had his way, they would end up under Hamas's tender protections, presumably forever. Here was Bernie Sanders yesterday. Israel was attacked in an absolutely horrific way by Hamas. 1,300 innocent people were slaughtered. Israel has a right to defend itself. But what Israel does not have a right to do, in my view, is to kill 12,000 people in six, seven weeks, two-thirds of whom are women and children. That they don't have a right to do. That's a violation of international law. Large swaths of the Democratic Party seem determined to prevent Israel from doing what they actually need to do to secure their future. This is why Senator Chris Murphy is calling for conditions on aid to Israel, which, by the way, is totally fine. We're America. We can put conditions on aid. But the conditions that he seeks to place on Israel are things like compliance with international law. Israel is already complying with international law. That's the whole point. But the idea here is to create a vague definition that leaves open the possibility of withdrawing aid based on Israel's current Gaza actions. On Friday, President Biden said conditioning aid would be a, quote, worthwhile thought. Yesterday, National Security Advisor spokesperson John Kirby wouldn't rule it out either. So the approach that we're taking with Israel and, quite frankly, with our partners in the region uh, is working. It's getting aid in to people that need it. It's getting a pause in the fighting. It's getting hostages out. It's getting Americans out. Uh, and quite frankly, we continue to urge and will continue to urge the Israelis, as they conduct military operations, to do so with the utmost care for innocent civilian so life. Democrats in the part in his party who say we need to start conditioning aid going forward. What would he say? I think he would say exactly what he said to y'all yesterday when he got asked this question. Uh, it's a worthwhile thought, but the approach that I'm taking now is working. The approach that we're taking now is working. It's getting results. This is ridiculous. The idea that you handcuff the party that is attempting to protect itself. The democracy, the democratic ally in the face of a giant terror group is ridiculous. It's also foolishness for people to treat the quote unquote two state solution as though that idiotic nostrum represents a true solution. It doesn't and it hasn't. It instead holds out the hope that the more pressure is applied to Israel, the more death brought to Israel's citizenry by terrorists, the more international pressure put on Israel, the more Israel will then concede to those very terrorists, which, of course, prolongs the conflict. I have a question. Does anyone really want a, ter a terrorist state? in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, because that's exactly what would exist if Palestinian statehood were declared today, as the, apparently the ridiculous government of Spain would wish. Hamas would end up the governing party in a new state with control over its border and its weaponry. Do you think the possibility of global conflict is larger or smaller under those circumstances? Now, President Biden has been more stalwart than I would have expected so far, but his language on this matter is insipid. Here is what he tweeted, quote, a two-state solution is the only way to guarantee the long-term security of both the Israeli and the Palestinian people. To make sure Israelis and Palestinians alike live in equal measure of freedom and dignity, we will not give up on working towards that goal. Can you imagine in the middle of World War II, if the president of the United States had tweeted out, what we really need is a peace agreement between America and Japan in order to end this terrible bloodshed and leave the Japanese fascists in charge of Japan? No? Because that wouldn't have made any sense? Right. Listen, the two-state solution may eventually, down the line, become a possibility. But ironically, talk about it prematurely prevents that possibility from ever materializing because every incentivization of terrorism increases terrorism, thus making such a solution absolutely impossible. How do we know this? Because what happened on October 7th was the culmination of three decades of large-scale terrorism pursued by the Palestinian Authority, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hamas. So what needs to happen? Exactly what Musk says. 
finish Hamas, re-educate the kids away from Islamism, build up the economy. But that would require moral clarity. And that, of course, is precisely what's missing these days from a disconnected West. In just one second, we'll get to that disconnected West. First, for most homeowners, window replacement, it's not something that they've done before. For many others, it's not something you want to do, but you actually have to do. If your windows are cracking or warping or your house is too hot or too cold, you need to call Renewal by Anderson. Have you put off replacing the windows in your home because it's too expensive? Well, I have great news. You can get a free in-home window consultation and a free quote from Renewal by Anderson. Renewal by Anderson's signature service is committed to giving you the best customer service experience possible, supported by the best people in the industry. Right now, Renewal by Anderson is offering a free in-home or virtual consultation on durable quality, affordable windows or patio doors for $0 down, zero payments, zero interest for one year. Text Shapiro to 200-300 for your free consultation. Save 375 bucks off every window and 750 bucks off every door. These savings won't last long. Be sure to check it out. Text Shapiro to 200-300. That's Shapiro to 200-300. Texting privacy policy and terms and conditions posted at textplan.us. Texting enrolls for occurring automated text marketing messages. Message and data rates may apply. Reply stop to opt out. Go to windowappointmentnow.com for full offer details. Also, as you know, we are celebrating the release of The Daily Wire's first ever full-length feature comedy, Lady Ballers, with a deal just for you. New Daily Wire Plus annual memberships are 50 bucks off. You need to hustle. This deal is available for a limited time only. So what exactly do you get with that Daily Wire Plus annual membership? Well, I'm so glad you asked. You get exclusive, ad-free, uncensored content from your favorite Daily Wire hosts. You know, me. Plus, on-demand access to all of our groundbreaking entertainment and documentaries that are making an enormous impact on culture. And yes, your Daily Wire Plus membership gets you access to Lady Ballers, streaming exclusively on Daily Wire Plus Friday night, December 1st, 8 p.m. Eastern. You get everything I talked about and more with your Daily Wire Plus annual membership, and you can have it all for 50 bucks off right now. Don't miss out. Grab this incredible deal right now at dailywire.com slash subscribe before it disappears forever. Visit dailywire.com slash subscribe now to join us in the fight to take back the culture and experience the Daily Wire like never before. So when it comes to lack of moral clarity in the West, that is pretty much everywhere. If there is one face of lack of moral clarity of the next generation of idiots that we have created through the toxic combination of legacy media attention, social media, and wokest philosophy, that face is the ridiculously dumb face of Greta Thunberg, who continues to be treated as though she has something worthy to say. She never had anything worthy to say. She was always a foolish child who was running around the globe saying dumb things to adults who wanted to feel better about themselves by allowing a foolish child to yell at them for the cameras. And she's a very privileged person, this, this Greta Thunberg. She grew up in a very rich family. And so that gave her the ability to basically drop out of school and go to a bunch of adult symposiums and yell at them about how the next generation demands of you random things. Those random things include degrowth, deindustrialization, and all the rest. Well, it turns out that that radically anti-Western viewpoint isn't confined to her environmentalism, which, of course, is just part and parcel of a broader intellectual rubric. The, the idea that you want to stop global warming doesn't have to be connected with degrowth. It doesn't have to be connected with a belief in the innate evils of the West, but it virtually always is. And Greta Thunberg is just a symptom of this. So she was caught on tape just last week in Stockholm shouting about anti-Zionism. What the hell does Greta Thunberg have to say about Israel? What exactly? I, I didn't notice, for example, that the people of Gaza and the, and the Arab Palestinians living in the West Bank are particularly concerned with environmental issues. What exactly? In fact, Israel is one of the greenest places on earth in terms of highly industrialized countries. What the hell is she taught? Again, it is all part and parcel of hatred for the West. That's all this is. She is so emblematic of what the West has become. A suicidal death cult of stupidity. Here is Greta Thunberg. Again, the fact that this was ever, she was like Time Magazine person of the year a few years ago for being a stupid child who ran around yelling at adults. It's amazing to me. She's so terrible. What exactly is she chanting? She's chanting in Swedish, quote, what are we going to do? We will crush Zionism. That's Greta Thunberg, climate activist, shouting about this sort of crap. Privileged white Western people shouting about the evils of white Westernism. Amazing, amazing stuff. And again, this is the privilege of living in the West is that you can be as hypocritical and ridiculous as you want to be. Whoopi Goldberg spent yesterday doing that. So they were considering over on The View, the bright minds over at The View, they were considering 
why it is that so many members of the Me Too movement are totally silent about the fact that Hamas raped like a bunch of women. That there is a giant report in the Washington Post about Hamas raping women so hard their pelvises broke, raping women and shooting them to death while they were still inside the women. And wh- wh- where, are all the, where are all the feminist rights organizations? Where is Linda Sarsour and the Women's March? Why, why is there no comment? Weird, weird. Well, here's Whoopi Goldberg trying to explain why. I am still devastated. We're two months since this war has been underway by the silence from women's group in this country about the rape being used as an act of war in this attack. Yeah. The fact that sexual violence was used against Israeli women in the major women's groups in this country have not come out and denounced it. This weekend, Sheryl Sandberg put out a gripping video calling for it. That violates every rule of, wa- of warfare. It is the height of immorality and the fact that the United Nations en- uh, entity for gender equality and women empowerment has been silent. The UN Committee on elimination of discrimination against women has been silent, and the international Me Too movement has perhaps, had a thing. Perhaps the reason they've been silent is for the same reason that you just described. They don't want to exacerbate. Well, they don't want to exacerbate. You know, listen, I, I, I know that this is really hard for people to sit still with. Yeah. So right now, we're glad people are coming out. And that's what we're going to keep talking about because we want to encourage, you know, the the bottom line truly is this. You don't have a choice. You have to end this. You have to end this. End what? You mean the people who rape women to death? Like that, that's what you would have to end. You know why Whoopi Goldberg is so silent on all of this? Because Whoopi Goldberg believes that Jews are just white people and white people are bad. That's why Whoopi Goldberg says this kind of stuff. This is the same idiot woman who suggested that Hitler killing Jews was white on white violence and was not, in fact, a form of racial discrimination. That's literally what she said. And then she was suspended and she tried to walk it back, but didn't really walk it back. That's what she believes. The reason she apparently is totally fine with pe- this is silence is violence. Whoopi Goldberg going out there and suggesting that it, if you didn't put the black square on your Facebook page in the middle of Black Lives Matter, it's because you hated black people, according to Whoopi Goldberg. Not because you disagreed with the basic premise, which is that black people are widely victimized in the United States, but because you hate black people. When Jews are actually victimized, when Jews are actually raped, Whoopi Goldberg's like, well, we, we do have to be we have to keep quiet about that. Well, you know, we wouldn't want to exacerbate the conflict. We wouldn't want to make it worse. You're right. Condemning rape would make it worse, Whoopi Goldberg. That nailed it. Nailed it. Again, there's only one reason Whoopi Goldberg is happy to say that about this particular population, and that's because they're Jews. That is the only reason that Whoopi Goldberg is willing to, well, you know, we just have to end this. We have to end this. Really? Not mentioning their rape ends this? The only way this ends is when Hamas is under the ground. That is, And I don't mean in the tunnels. I mean dead, just to clarify. But the reason Whoopi Goldberg believes all this is because, again, she buys into this oppressor, oppressed racialist matrix, and that is an evil matrix. It is a very, very evil matrix. That that way of thinking is pathetic and disgusting. In just one second, we'll get to lack of moral clarity from our friends in the media. First, the Ben Shapiro Show is supported by Grand Canyon University, an affordable private Christian university with a vibrant campus in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. Ranked top 20 in the country by Niche.com, GCU is a missional Christ-centered university that strives to foster a culture of community, giving, and impact. GCU's goal is to help you develop into a servant leader who makes a difference through finding your purpose. With 330 academic programs and over 270 online as of June 2023, GCU integrates the free market system with a welcoming Christian worldview into your bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree. You'll have support from your own university counselor who takes a personalized approach to helping you achieve your goals. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University, private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu today. Also, Let's say that you're a business owner and you need to grow that team. Well, you need to hire the best people. We're very lucky here at Daily Wear. We have a bunch of wonderful people who work here with us. We got a lot of those people by working with ZipRecruiter. Right now, ZipRecruiter is giving you the ability to check this out for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Now, you might be asking how ZipRecruiter is a gift to those who are hiring. ZipRecruiter uses smart matching technology to identify the most qualified people for a wide variety of roles. ZipRecruiter lets top candidates know when they're a great match for your job to encourage them to apply. The bow on top, if you see a candidate who is a great match for your job, ZipRecruiter makes it easy to send them a personal invite so they are more likely to apply. Get your hiring wrapped up quickly with ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter will get a quality candidate within day one. Just go to this exclusive web address right now. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. Go check them out right now. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. The lack of moral clarity is not just from the activist class. It, of course, is replete in our media. There are people I like, like Piers Morgan and I. I consider Piers a friend. 
I got to say that his coverage of this issue, he's trying to both sides it. So he's trying to say, well, I'm being objective. I'm being as objective as possible. But when he gives monologues like the one that he did yesterday about Israel's activities against Hamas, I got to say he's not both sidesing it. So here was Piers Morgan yesterday. He did a monologue essentially accusing Israel of the same sort of terrorism that Hamas perpetrated on October 7th. That's insane. I'm sorry, it's just morally wrong. It's wrong on a factual level. It's wrong on a moral level. It's just not true. Here was Piers doing that routine yesterday. I've been picked up this weekend by people reminding me of tweets from 2014. Back then, Israel launched a massive bombardment of Gaza in response to the murder of three Israeli teenagers in the West Bank. What happened, I'm asked. Why did I change my position? Well, I haven't changed my position. Israel committed atrocities in 2014, in my estimation. It was a completely disproportionate response to what had happened. It looked more like revenge to me than a military strategy, and President Obama told them to call it off. Well, during that bombardment, I asked at what point does Israel's current military strategy become the very terrorism it professes to be fighting? And today, I'm beginning to ask myself that exact same question. Based on what? Based on what? I mean, first of all, I don't, un I don't think the peers or many in the media understand what proportionality means. Proportionality does not mean that the original atrocity has to be responded to, quote unquote, proportionately. That's not what proportionality means. Okay, if you murder my child, I don't then get to murder your child. That's not proportionality. Proportion means that the means used to achieve a military end must be proportional to the military end. In other words, if I want to kill one bad guy, I can't just drop an A-bomb, right? That's what that means. Okay, but again, this idea that Israel has to be hampered in its military aims or that Israel has magical weapons where you wave the magic Harry Potter wand and all the bad guys disappear, but all the civilians are left over. That's not true. By the way, Pierce was wrong in 2014. The fact of the matter is that in 2014, by the generalized statistics of the people who were killed in that particular conflict, about 2,100 people were killed in that particular conflict by Israel in the Gaza Strip. And that was prompted by the kidnapping of th and murder of three Israeli teenagers as well as a series of rockets fired into Israel as per Hamas's usual arrangement. In that conflict, according to the measurements available from the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is significantly more reliable than the UN or the Gaza Health Ministry, 36% killed were civilians, 44% were members of Hamas or other terrorist groups, and 20% were quote-unquote uncategorized males between the ages of 16 and 50, which typically means civilians who are associated with Hamas or one of the other terrorist groups. This sort of moral lack of clarity, of course, means that no one can win. A war, but no one can win a war under these circumstances. Let's be clear about this: there is no war that can be won by a Western power against a terrorist group embedded in a civilian population under the circumstances that Piers is describing as "quote unquote" terrorism. It is not terrorism to try to kill people in the opposing terrorist group, and they are hiding among civilians. That's not terrorism. Terrorism is when you go in and you slaughter civilians purposefully not as collateral damage, purposefully as the goal of your attack, which is what Hamas did. Pierce tried to extend this to, uh, to questions that he was asking of Elon Levy, who's the spokesperson for the Israeli prime minister. Here, here he was yesterday. By your own admission, uh, just a few uh, moments ago, he said that they make it incredibly difficult for you to work out who is a Hamas terrorist and who is a civilian. And that seems to me part of the problem that you have with the optics of this to the wider world is that they're seeing horrible imagery all day long. I mean, it's it's just the worst thing I've ever seen all over social media. Of, well, the worst thing of, we've ever seen were the atrocities that Hamas perpetrated on October No, no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just saying, I, yeah, I've not seen, thankfully, I've not seen what many journalists have seen, which is the 45-minute film of that. And I understand it's absolutely horrific. And I'm not making is, any, I'm I'm not making any comparison. Bodies, but I'm not, I, I, I would not say anything is worse than that. So for the record, uh, but... The horrible imagery all day long, it is suggesting to people that there are thousands and thousands of thousands of women and a lot of children, maybe as many as five, 6,000 children now, have been killed by these uh, uh, airstrikes and now the ground attack. And I think the problem that you have, and I say this respectfully, the problem you have is that you don't actually know how many Hamas terrorists you're killing. I mean, that, if you're honest, you don't, do you? OK, well, I mean, under those circumstances, who would? I mean, you, you, the answer is a lot, by the way. They do know in approximate numbers how many Hamas terrorists they have killed. But if the idea is that the only way that you can fight a terrorist group is presumably by knowing exactly 
exactly how many terrorists you are killing and only killing those terrorists, no one will ever win a war against a terror group again. It's not possible. It's just not possible to do that. By the way, when we talk about the number of, of civilian casualties in Gaza, it's very difficult to separate who is a civilian from who is not when you're talking about a 17-year-old male who is hanging out with Hamas. Is he a member of Hamas or is he a civilian? This also happens to ring true with regard to the statistics about quote-unquote children. Now, you've heard that Israel is keeping women and children in prison. That many of the prisoners being released are women and children. In the same way, you're hearing that described in, in the Gaza Strip. Well, I mean, they are technically women and minors that are being held in prison for terrorist activity. So it depends who's being killed. Again, we don't have great statistics on any of that because since when have you in real time been able to count the exact number of people who are dying in a war? That you can't win a war under those circumstances. If the idea, again, is that immunity is bought by simply hiding among civilians, that means terrorists win every war from now until the end of time, and you have now created a massive incentive structure for them to hide among civilians in violation of the Geneva Conventions. So in other words, the punishment for violation of the Geneva Conventions, according to peers and many in the media, is immunity. Nothing happens to you. You sit there and everybody just lives with it. It's totally great. By the way, even when Pierce says he's not equating what happened on October 7th to what happened inside Gaza, he literally did so in his monologue. He literally said that this is now tipping over into the terrorism that Israel saw on October 7th. So that's not even true. And that lack of moral clarity is what means that the West loses wars. Forget about Israel. The West in general loses wars on this basis. And that is a serious, serious problem. And meanwhile, Joe Biden continues to trail in the polls. There's a new article out at Real Clear Politics from Sean Trend today. And, and he points out that right now, if you had to put betting money on it, Trump is the favorite. He says, in 2016, Trump led Hillary Clinton for all of five days in the national Real Clear Politics polling average, each of those days in the immediate aftermath of the Republican convention. He led in 29 polls taken over the course of the entire campaign. In 2020, Trump never led Biden in the national RCP average. So counting the LA Times tracker as a single poll, Trump led in a total of 24 national polls in January of 2020. This cycle, he has led in that many since mid-September. He's led in more polls in the past three weeks than he did against Biden in the entirety of the 2020 campaign. If you look at the state level polling, Trump is currently up in virtually every battleground state. Mitt Romney never led Barack Obama in the RCP average in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, or Ohio. So where is it today? Trump is leading in the real clear politics polling average in Michigan. He is leading in Pennsylvania. He is narrowly trailing in Wisconsin, but he's led in some of the polls. In Florida, he's way ahead. In Arizona, he leads. In Georgia, he leads. In Ohio, he leads. So here's what Sean Trent says, quote, in other words, analyzing this election correctly isn't just a matter of giving lip service to the notion that Trump can win this election. The correct position right now is that Trump is better positioned in the polls to win this election than any GOP nominee since at least 2004. Not only that, he habitually overperforms his polls. Frankly, if you're willing to set favorites this far out, you should almost certainly declare Donald Trump the favorite. Does this mean that Trump will win the presidency? There are good arguments why perceptions of the economy will improve between now and then, although maybe they won't. Perhaps Trump will underperform his polling this time as the GOP did in 2022, although maybe he won't. There are good arguments Trump's criminal trials will erode his standing in the polls, although having watched Trump's scandals unfold for the better part of four decades, maybe they won't. This all makes for fun speculation, but when the conversation returns to what we do know, there's only one correct answer. Trump can win this election and right now is well positioned to do so. And Joe Biden is struggling, man. He's having a tough time. Again, he really ha- he's contending not only with fires on the foreign front, but also he's contending with the fact that people just don't think the economy is very good. There's an entire New York Times article titled, Even Most Biden Voters Don't See a Thriving Economy. Quote, a majority of those who back President Biden in 2020 say today's economy is fair or poor, ordinarily a bad omen for incumbents seeking re-election. By swing state? In the swing states, the percentage of Joe Biden's 2020 supporters who say the economy is excellent or good, 30% under 50K by income. 37% if you're from 50K to 100K, and 42% say the economy is excellent or good if you're over $100,000. Meanwhile, if you say the economy is poor or only fair, 70% of people making under 50 grand, 61% of people making from 50 to 100 grand, and 57% say the economy is only poor or only fair if you're making over $100,000. And by age, 89% of people aged 18 to 29 say the economy is poor or only fair. We're talking about Joe Biden's 2020 supporters. We're not talking about the entire broad electorate. Those are amazing numbers, by the way. That is a serious problem for Joe Biden. Naturally, he's trying to teach people that um, they're just wrong about the economy. Actually, things are going swimmingly. Here was Joe Biden yesterday explaining that Thanksgiving actually was cheap. 
As a share of earnings this Thanksgiving, dinner was the fourth cheapest ever on record. I want you all to know that. <laughs> I look at all the press, look at that. The press is particularly excited about that, I can see. But look, all kidding aside, that's not all. On Thanksgiving two years ago, 100 container ships were waiting in dock to dock in the ports. They were lined up 100 long out into the ocean. This year, there were less than 10, meaning that today, as folks start their holiday shopping, shelves are stocked, meaning that if major appliances like a stove or a fridge broke down over Thanksgiving, you can replace it faster and 9% cheaper than you did two years ago. Um, well, um, there's only one problem, which is no one believes that. Okay, according to The Hill, in 2022, the price for a classic Thanksgiving feast was 64.05. That was up more than 10 bucks than 2021. It declined a little bit in 2023, but it's still way, way, way higher. Costs are still 25% higher than they were in 2019 before the COVID-19 pandemic, according to The Hill. So yeah, nobody believes this. Trying to talk people into the idea that the economy is going swimmingly is a is a failure in imagination by the Biden administration. And they've got, a, I, I, honestly, I'm not sure how they pull out of this uh, tailspin. I really don't know. We're here in the studio with Montana Tucker. She's a model, singer, dancer, and activist. And of course, you've seen her all over social media, particularly right now, promoting the fight against anti-Semitism. Montana, great to see you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming in. I'm excited. So how did you get into this fight against anti-Semitism in the first place? I feel like I've been fighting this fight for a long time now. I, one year ago, leading up to Kristallnacht last November, I released a Holocaust educational docuseries called How to Never Forget. I grew up with Holocaust survivor grandparents uh, from Hungary and Romania, and I grew up hearing their stories my whole life. So I've always been educated about the Holocaust, you know, not just in school, not just from movies, but from direct stories from my grandparents. And when my Zadie passed away four years ago at 97, I rewatched his Shoah Foundation um, testimonials and and my grandma's. And I was like, I need to do something with this. So I actually went to Poland and filmed a whole series. So I've been now for the past year fighting anti-Semitism on my social media, in person, going around, speaking, and when everything happened with Israel, then I have now basically taken over my social media posting about it. So what has the uptick in anti-Semitism that you've seen been like since, since October 7th? I mean, I think the actual st- statistic is 400 percent, they say. But what is happening online is, you know, something that anti-Semitism has always been here, right? It's always been around. But now with the power of social media, it's been taken to a whole new level. And what's happening on social media is now going into the college campuses, is going into, you know, high schools even. There was a high school teacher that the other day had to be locked in her room because there were protests. I mean, in high schools. So I'm seeing it directly to myself on social media. But every day we're hearing about new stories now, what is happening in schools and on the streets, at restaurants. People are boycotting restaurants because they support Israel. In some cases, they're even boycotting restaurants that serve Israeli food that was happening yeah. in Philadelphia. It's totally wild. So you've been doing some amazing activist work. You've been, you've been with people on, on all sides of the political aisle to talk about anti-Semitism. For folks who don't watch your feed and haven't been following, what are the kind of stuff that, that you've been doing? Yeah, so I've been, you know, going to, you know, whether it's political, going to the White House and speaking about it there, or going to different schools, or going, you know, I just spoke at the rally in D.C., um, which was 300,000 people, which is an insane number of people to come together to support Israel and to combat anti-Semitism. And, you know, my following on on social media was not built from my activism. It was built from my dancing, from my singing. You know, I've collaborated with people of all walks of life, all ethnicities, all races. So to use my social media to be postings about Israel, you know, was risky, some may say, but I felt that if I have the voice and I have the power to maybe educate someone to share what's going on, I know that's what my grandparents would want me to do, uh, what they, I wish they had a voice back then and wish, wish the Jewish people had a voice back then to be able to uh, voice what was going on. So I feel like it's our responsibility now with these platforms to make sure we use them and educate. I mean, it definitely is a brave thing to take a, a social media following that is on a completely different topic and swivel it over to something that's insanely serious and really threatening in the world right now. I mean, I'm lucky. I, I do a political show, which means that I can just talk about what's going on politically pretty easily. My audience can move with me. It's, it's stuff happening in the world. But for you to take a, a complete 
image that has been built from doing fun stuff, the, the singing yeah. and the dancing and all, and, and shift that over to something deeply serious. How have fans reacted to that? You know, when I first did the the Holocaust series a year ago, I was nervous. I was definitely very nervous. I was like, people follow me to see me be happy, to see me dancing in the streets of Hollywood Boulevard, you know, to see me collaborate with you know, Terry Crews. Like, no one's going to want me to sit here and do something very dark, very serious. I mean, me going to Auschwitz. Have you, have you ever been? I have not been, no. Something that anyone watching, I mean, no matter what religion you are, what race you are, it is something that I think everyone should go and experience to see what can really happen. Um, and that's very dark. That's very serious. I mean, I never went, so everyone was seeing my my natural reaction. I was hy- hysterically crying half the time in the series. You know, I'm, I'm, you're, you're walking over mass graves in the series. So it was risky. And I was like, you know what? If it impacts one person, if one person sees this and is impacted, like, great. And honestly, the series took off in a way that I never expected. I really didn't expect it. And it, it really has changed people's views and opinions. I've had people write me saying like, you know, I was taught to hate Jews my whole life. And after, you know, hearing your story and hearing your grandparents' story, like you've changed my mind. Or people who aren't Jewish saying, you know, you've inspired me to want to go learn more about my, uh, you know, his family's history. Um, so it's it's been interesting. You know, of course, there's a lot of the a lot of the hate that has come with it. I mean, definitely more hate. But there also has been a lot of really positive beautiful things that have come from it. So after doing that series about the Holocaust, and obviously you mentioned growing up in a, in a home with, with Holocaust survivor grandparents, and where do you think we stand with anti-Semitism in the world right now? It's crazy that it's 2023, almost 2024, and we are still here. And we are here, actually, not still here. We are in a place that we've, I don't think we've been since the Holocaust, you know? So people need to take this more seriously I think that this is why I keep saying this is how the Holocaust began, because people aren't taking this seriously enough. And to understand, people think, oh, the Holocaust could never happen again, you know? But that's why Israel is so important. My my Zadie would always tell me how important the state of Israel was, because he felt if Israel was around, that the Holocaust would have never happened. And that's why it's so important that we protect Israel and we stand for Israel during this time more than ever. And people saying anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. Uh, it is. And it's it's really a scary time that we're in right now. And I can't believe that we have to, like, prove ourselves again. You know, back in the day, my, my, my Zadie would tell me stories that he would have friends his entire life. And then all of a sudden, when all the announcements came out about how terrible the Jews were and, you know, all the propaganda, you know, friends turned on him, started spitting on him in the street, started beating him up and, and saying, you dirty Jew. I mean, that's what's happening on social media and you're having conversations with friends that you can't even imagine having like a year ago you would have never imagined having these types of conversations with them so it's a really scary time we're in and that's why it needs to be taken seriously um and to make sure that the never forget never again doesn't happen again yeah the the denialism is particularly astonishing i mean when, when you look at the amount on social media of people who are just saying None of this ever occurred, or Israel's exaggerating what happened, or the 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 forty beheaded babies that that, that therefore all the babies are alive, or Israel's lying, or you know, all all of this. It, it is boggling to the mind because for those who actually think that truth matters and that facts matter, it, it's pretty evident that for a huge percentage of the population, that just is not true. The narrative matters a lot more than the facts. It makes no sense that at first they're saying the hostages aren't aren't like when people are in the streets pulling down the posters. There are videos of people saying they're not hostages. Hamas didn't take them. Okay, now we have all the videos of them, the hostages being returned. Where's your denial in that one? Oh, they didn't really murder them. They didn't re- hit. Then you have all the footage that comes out online every day. People are trying to, I, I'm involved in all these groups that people are begging people to see this footage. I don't want to see the, you know, the 45 minute long because I believe it. But the people who are denying it need to watch that footage. They need to watch that footage because how can you deny that? How can you deny that? It really is astonishing. Well, you're doing amazing work. It's Montana Tucker. Thank you so much thank for stopping you. by, and thank you for doing what you're doing. It's a brave and and uh, and necessary thing, so I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All righty, folks, we've reached the end of today's show. We'll be back here tomorrow with much more. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. If you want to cut through the madness of all the top stories in politics, culture, and even religion, which is the foundation of politics and culture, then come check out The Michael Knowles Show, where you can join me for an authentically conservative perspective. I'll see you then.